Good afternoon and welcome to our second virtual brown bag. My name is Abby Deweist. I'm the adult programming librarian at Fairport Public Library and I will be your host today but I will also be reviewing my own books. So the first book I'm going to discuss today is The Oregon Trail, A New American Journey by Rinker Buck. Now this book was suggested to me by a patron who came into the library just so excited about this book. She wrote a little review, she said, can you put this on a display? And that got me interested right away. I figured what better way to share this with our Fairport readers than to do it for brown bags. So I grabbed it and I started reading it right away. Now this book is pretty much a travelogue. You hear about Rinker Buck who got this wild idea to buy mules and a covered wagon and ride it halfway across the country. He's following the old Oregon Trail, which does still exist, which I did not realize before I read that. There is so much of it still intact. Um, but he crossed the 2,000 mile journey from Missouri into Kansas and Nebraska, trekked through Wyoming and Idaho, and finally arrived in Oregon. Now, I think the best part about this book was the sibling interactions because Rinker decides to bring his brother Nick along because he is fantastic at handling the mules and fixing the wagon that they know they're going to have to fix because it's an original. It's got the wooden wheels, it's got, you know, the wooden brakes, which I had a lot of fun hearing about. So some of the best parts of this book are the sibling interactions and the kind of bickering that they get, that every family gets when they're traveling for a very long time together. So it's also got a bunch of amazing American history in there, things that I never thought I wanted to know, um, but that I really enjoyed learning about. So even if you're not a huge fan of the Oregon Trail and you didn't play the game when you were a kid, you're still gonna enjoy this book because it's well-written, it's funny, it's lyrically written, so it's not like you're reading a nonfiction book, it's like you're hearing a friend tell you a story across a campfire. So I highly recommend The Oregon Trail by Rinker Buck. So the next book I wanna talk about is actually a series of books. It's a series of four short books. There are long full length books after, but I'm just gonna focus on one through four. And it's called The Murderbot Diaries by Martha Wells. So this is a science fiction novel, but it is a blast. Every single one of these books is short, but so enjoyable to read. It follows Murderbot, which is a snarky introverted cyborg who kind of committed the unprecedented crime of crack, cracking and hacking into his governor, which is the, the system that makes him obey orders. So he's hacked through that and he ha now has control of himself. And the best part about that is, is that all he really wants to do is sit and watch old TV shows. And he is the introverted, awkward, amazing cyborg that I never knew I needed in my life. <laughs> so if you are not used to reading science fiction novels, these are a good way to start because they're short. And if you don't like them, you don't have to move on. But I gotta tell you, from book one to book four, I am hooked. I love being inside Murderbot's head. I love hearing his social anxiety because as humans, I can relate to that. And I just found it to be such a blast. Martha Wells has a great style of writing. She makes science fiction accessible. You'll be reading words you may not understand, but it's shown to you by the way she uh, crafts her art. So I highly recommend the Murderbot series. There's the four books and I hope you like them. So next up, we are gonna join two of our newest librarians at the Fairport Public Library, and they're gonna talk about their books. Here's Hannah and Sarah. Hi everyone, my name is Hannah. I am the technology librarian at Fairport Public Library. Today, I'm going to be talking with you about one of my favorite nonfiction books called Digital Minimalism by Cal Newport. So Cal is a professor of computer science, and he also studies psychology of how technology works on the brain. And this book, Digital Minimalism, specifically discusses how social media impacts our ability to focus and the ways that it causes us to behave in similar manners to addiction um, behavior. So I'm going to read a quote to start us off. Outsourcing your autonomy to an attention economy conglomerate 
as you do when you mindlessly sign up for whatever new hot service emerges from the Silicon Valley venture capitalist class is the opposite of freedom and will likely degrade your individuality. So it sounds pretty extreme, but basically this book is split into two parts. The first part is going to explain to you some of the peer reviewed research, as well as tell you some individual stories about the way social media impacts your brain, how it changes your ability to focus, and also how it um, creates addiction behaviors. The second part of the book explains some recommendations that you could use as a technology user um, to avoid some of the more negative impacts of social media on your mind. So there's a lot of great tips and suggestions in the book. I have one bookmarked here to share with you. One of the things that he suggests, and this is just one of many, um, there's four larger categories, and this is just one suggestion in a subcategory. He says, fix or build something every week. And when he says that, he's talking about a tangible item. So knit a pair of socks, mend your jeans, build some kitchen cabinets, do something with your hands and your mind every week. Um, so he gives some really good concrete suggestions as to how to disconnect a little bit from the digital addiction. And um, in the end, he allows you to have a really well-rounded perspective. He's not um, claiming that all technology is bad by any means. In fact, as a computer science professor, the author is a really big fan, as am I, as the technology librarian. We all love tech. Um, but to sum it up, I'll read his definition of digital minimalism. Digital minimalism is a philosophy of technology use in which you focus your online time on a small number of carefully selected and optimized activities that strongly support things you value and then happily miss out on everything else. So in the end, it's all about values, finding your own personal values and letting go of all of the other stuff that you can call nonsense online. Um, I'm a big fan. I would like everybody to be healthy mentally while still taking advantage of today's technology. So check out this book. Um, there's probably already a picture of it up here. <laughs> check it out from the library. If you can't get it in paper copy, check it out and see if it's um, on either Overdrive or Hoopla. Uh, the irony, of course, of reading on a digital device when it's a book about minimizing your digital interactions, but better than nothing. All right. Thanks for joining and happy reading, everyone. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Bishop Valleys, and I'm the media services librarian here at the Fairport Public Library. I don't know about you, but sometimes in the dead of winter or during a really stressful time in my life, like this pandemic, I find myself needing a lighthearted book, something to make me laugh and cheer me up. My all-time favorite for just such occasions is Howl's Moving Castle by the late Diana Wynne-Jones. Howl's Moving Castle is a teen fantasy novel that was published in 1986. It is the first book in a three-part series and is followed by Castle in the Air and House of Many Ways. However, it successfully stands on its own with the other two books in the series being optional. Because of this, today I'm just going to be discussing the first one. I don't think there's any better way for me to introduce this story and convey the author's delightful writing style than to just read you the first couple, chap first couple paragraphs. So here goes. Chapter one, in which Sophie talks to Hat. In the land of Ingeri, where such things as seven league boots and cloaks of invisibility really exist, it is quite a misfortune to be born the eldest of three. Everyone knows you are the one who will fail first and worst if the three of you set out to seek your fortunes. Sophie Hatter was the eldest of three sisters. She was not even the child of a poor woodcutter, which might have given her some chance of success. Her parents were well-to-do and kept a ladies' hat shop in the prosperous town of Market Shipping. 
True, her own mother died when Sophie was two years old and her sister Letty was one year old, and their father married his youngest shop assistant, a pretty blonde girl called Fanny. Fanny shortly gave birth to the third sister, Martha. This ought to have made Sophie and Letty into ugly sisters, but in fact, all three girls grew up very pretty indeed, though Letty was the one everyone said was the most beautiful. Fanny treated all three girls with the same kindness and did not favor Martha in the least. Mr. Hatter was proud of his three daughters and sent them all to the best school in town. Sophie was the most studious. She read a great deal and very soon realized how little chance she had of an interesting future. It was a disappointment to her, but she was still happy enough looking after her sisters and grooming Martha to seek her fortune when the time came. All right. Now, as you can tell, the author is letting us know from the get-go that she will not be following any of those cliche fairy tale themes like the wicked stepmother or rags to riches. No, this seems to be more a case of our main character, Sophie, settling for a boring but safe life and trying to convince herself that she's okay with it. I just want to pause here for a second and mention that when I first read Howl's Moving Castle, I found this chapter to be really off-putting, as it just breezes right through a bunch of details. It feels so rushed and even a little disjointed that I was about to put the book down for good, but I'm so glad I kept reading. This first chapter is just the author setting the stage for the rest of the story, and once you get into the next couple chapters, the story really picks up and becomes very engaging. Okay, back to Sophie and her life choices. So we later learn in this first chapter that Sophie settles for a quiet life taking over the hat shop while her two sisters are apprenticed to a baker and a witch. However, Sophie continues wishing for a more adventurous life and in the land of Ingeri, with witches and wizards running about, she doesn't have to wait long for something very interesting to happen. One morning, Sophie encounters a well-to-do customer demanding to see some hats. Sophie shows her a number of hats, all of which this customer snubs. Finally, Sophie asks why she bothered to come into a hat shop that was so clearly beneath her. Unfortunately, this customer turns out to be the Witch of the Waste, who has apparently confused Sophie with someone else. By the time the witch leaves, Sophie is aged several decades, quite literally. Now that she's been cursed to be an old woman, Sophie decides to leave the hat shop and sets off to where we're not told. It actually seems as if Sophie herself doesn't know, but she definitely does not want anyone to see her in this current state. As she heads into the countryside, night falls and the only shelter she manages to find is a moving castle that is known to be the home of the wicked wizard Howell. The adventure really takes off from here, and Sophie finds herself thoroughly mixed up in the world of magic, full of secret bargains, jilted witches, and a wizard in hiding. But will she ever be able to break her curse? You'll have to grab a copy of this book to find out. Howl's Moving Castle is an exciting and hilarious romp through the imaginary world of Ingeri. It's filled with mystery, suspense, and even a little romance. Many of you are probably more familiar with Howl's Moving Castle as the Japanese anime movie by Hayao Miyazaki. The movie is loosely based on Diana Wynne Jones' book. I actually did not find out about the book until after watching the movie, and you're probably wondering whether I prefer the book over the movie, which is, of course, what we book lovers usually say. But in this case, I love them both. Howl's Moving Castle the book and Howl's Moving Castle the movie are so different that I actually find them both excellent in their own unique way. So for this book to film adaptation, I'm not going to advise you one way or another. I think that whether you read the book first or you've already watched the movie, you will be delighted with this humorous and enchanting story. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Those books are very different, but they both sound very interesting. Next up, we're going to go over to the children's room and we're going to see Lauren and Tara, and they're both going to talk about some books for you. Hi, I'm Lauren and I'm one of the children's librarians here at Fairport Public Library. And this month I thought I'd do something a little bit different. Um, I know a lot of you 
have children in your lives, maybe your kids, grandkids, kids that you just know. And a lot of you just enjoy children's books as well. So I thought it'd be fun if we uh, talked a little bit about some children's books that might be great to read with the kids in your life or on your own. So the first one I wanted to talk about is one of my favorite books of all time. It's The Book With No Pictures, um, written by B.J. Novak, who you might know. He's one of the writers and actors on The Office. He's done tons of awesome things, including creating this book. This book is the perfect read aloud um, if you want to make everyone around you laugh, young and old and in between. Um, <clears throat> the first time I read this book, I was... Uh, I was reading it to a group of kids and I had not read it before and everyone was on the floor laughing by the end. So it's just super fun. And obviously, you know, who reads a picture book without pictures, but when you get into it, I'll just show you a little bit. It tells you that it's a book with no pictures and, um, you know, it could seem boring, but there are some rules. Uh, when someone reads a book, they have to read what the words say. And you'll see as you go through, some of the words are really, silly like blork and blurf and and you, you get through the book um there's just it, it forces you to make silly voices like um be, be a robot monkey you know things that kids and adults will love um you have to sing as part of the book um there's just wild just all right I'm gonna just have to show you the wildest page where you're forced to make all of these intense sounds you are sure to make children and adults around you laugh. So this is a great book. You're gonna to wanna to read it again and again. Um, and if you do read it to children, they will beg you to keep reading it to them. So that's the first one I wanted to talk about. The next book I wanna talk about is a newer book. Um, it just came out, um, I think this year, it may be the end of 2020, but I think it actually just was published in the beginning of 2021. Anyway, it's called Eyes That Kiss in the Corners. Um, it's written by Joanna Ho and illustrated by Dung Ho. And what is so beautiful about this book, I'm actually gonna tell you a little bit from the, the front cover here. Um, in this story, there's a young girl who notices that her eyes look different than her friend's eyes. Um, they have big round eyes with uh, long lashes, but she has eyes that kiss in the corners and glow like warm tea. And as you go through this book, you'll see it's a story about a young girl and her mom and her grandmother and how the shape of their eyes tie them all together and are um, and just all of the beautiful things that they do together. The illustrations are amazing. Um, and I just think this is such a great book that you'll enjoy reading on your own or with kids. Um, and it really uh, just displays the beauty of, of family and um, definitely one that you'll wanna check out. Uh, one more book I wanted to share with you. It's actually a series that I'm loving. It's a nonfiction series. Um, it's called Wildlife LOL. I mean, just look at this cover. You are going to want to dig in because it's got hilarious jokes, wacky facts, amazing photos, um, and jokes like beekaboo, I see you. Beak, like an eagle, has a beak. So this bald eagle book, um, you'll see that there are a lot of different animals that this series covers, but um, it's just, it's full of great facts, great nonfiction facts, but then there are jokes mixed in like LOL. What kind of animal doesn't need a comb? A bald eagle. <laughs> um, I love it. I, um, I just love the colors. I love the word bubbles. Without my warm feathers, I'd be frozen. A frozen bird. Oh my goodness. So Obviously, kids will love this book if you want to share it with them, a great way to share facts with them, and you will love it as well. Um, so in this one, we only have one copy in our system, but we have a lot of different um, editions, so there's there's other animals that you can check out, um, so we'll have those with the rest of the brown bag books. That's all I have for today, um, and I hope you check out some of those books. Hi, I'd like to share with you two Pride and Prejudice inspired novels. Mr. and Mrs. Fitzwilliam Darcy, Two Shall Become One by Sharon Lathan is a continuation of sorts. In the author's foreword, Lathan tells a tale of her inspiration coming not from Jane Austen words,
but the 2005 movie adaptation of those words. I love Jane Austen, but I am not a Jane Austen purist, so I was able to take this book for what it is, a continuation of a movie, which I absolutely loved and wished it never end. The story, which opens moments after the lavish wedding ceremony, finds the new Mr. and Mrs. Darcy nestled into a carriage bound for their honeymoon. As their love story unfolds, Darcy and Elizabeth reveal to each other how their relationship blossomed. From misunderstanding to perfect understanding and harmony, there is a marriage filled with romance, sensuality, and the beauty of a deep abiding love. Lathan vividly imagines this young and energetic couple as they immerse themselves in their profound love and face the challenges of their era. If you've seen the 2005 movie adaptation and were moved by the final scene when Matthew McFadden's Darcy proclaims to Kira Knightley's Elizabeth that she has bewitched him body and soul, will immediately connect with this book. The Trials of the Honorable F. Darcy by Sarah Angelini is a modern retelling of the original, but with quite a few surprising twists. Elizabeth Bennett, a fresh-faced, sassy trial attorney, takes an instant dislike to Judge Fitzwilliam Darcy, a wealthy British landowner who, thanks to an American mother, holds dual citizenship and thus can be a judge in the California town of Marrington. Tempers and sparks fly in Judge Darcy's courtroom and outside as the two match wits and try to fight their overwhelming attraction. When they meet up in England at an international law conference, they embark on a hot and heavy affair. Back in the States though, ethical considerations intrude and each is subjected to a torturous period of soul searching before they can find their way back to each other. Angelini did a fantastic job of modernizing and adapting the characters of PNP to the 21st century and the legal world. Jane and Charles Bingley are surgeons. Louisa Hurst appears in the form of Elizabeth's gay best friend, Lou Hurst, and Darcy and Caroline are casually sleeping together. Darcy was a perfectly haughty and judicial judge. I could easily see Elizabeth Bennett as a persuasive and preserving defense attorney, and I laughed out loud at the hysterical hippie version of Mrs. Bennett. I loved reading this delightfully romantic and passionate journey of Darcy and Lizzie. Sarah Angelini established a creative and unique premise for the beloved Pride and Prejudice characters. However, I should point out that it does not follow the PNP plot sequence exclusively. In addition, I would recommend this book for a mature audience because of the profanity and very steamy intimate scenes included. Both books I have read multiple times, and if you two are open-minded and love to read Pride and Prejudice inspired novels, then you should not miss these books. Thank you both, and thank you for providing us with some interesting and unique versions to Brown Bag. We haven't had children's books before, as far as I know, so I appreciate that difference. Next up, we've got two more of our librarians, Carrie and Carly, and they're gonna both be talking about some very fascinating books. Hello, everyone. My name is Carrie Bordeaux, and today I'm going to be reviewing for the virtual Brown Bag, The Adventurer's Son by Roman Dial. So this is a memoir. It came out last year, just around the time the pandemic was hitting. I found it out about it maybe a few months ago, um, listening to a Fresh Air episode with um, Dave Davies. And he was interviewed and his story is just intriguing. He um, lives in Alaska and his son um, ended up going down to um, Costa Rica in 2014 and disappeared. And the entire Dial family, they are very avid um, hikers and they're very outdoorsy. They do a lot of pack rafting. They're probably the most experienced outdoors people and family that I could think of. Um, so to read this story, it's quite engaging. The first half of the story talks about Roman Dial, who's the father, his upbringing, how he ended up ended ended up in Alaska, became um, a biologist, does a lot of like cross um, trekking and hiking, especially in the winter months and doing a lot of cool things. And then how he had his children and met his wife and then how he got his kids involved in doing these really amazing um, adventures like going to Borneo with his kids and his family and 
doing all these different trips and then doing a little more research outside of the book, find, finding out that him and his wife have traveled to like Patagonia and like New Zealand and did all these cool hikings and all, all this cool stuff. But anyway, so the book, the second half of the book talks about um, his son going down to Costa Rica and how his son wanted to get lost in Costa Rica and ended up going off trail and then the, the story coming back to what happened to his son. So this is a little bit of an adventure story for those that can't travel, um, that really want to go and travel. Myself having been to Costa Rica, I was really intrigued to see what part of Costa Rica this took place in, um, all the different in-depth jungle expertise that was needed for this type of adventure. Roman and his wife ended up going down to Costa Rica um, for multiple years trying to find what happened to their son. And in conclusion, they did end up getting an answer, which I'm not gonna tell you. But I think this book is just like a really great read. There's also an audio book, which is really good too, to listen to it a little bit of listening as well. It's just such an engaging story about a father trying to find his son in another country, in the middle of, of nowhere in a deep jungle that people do not really go into. Um, and like all these things that come up and happen, it's, you know, it's a scary story for, in the sense that, you know, he does lose his son, but it's, it's also an adventure story that you get to go and experience this entire, you know, life with Roman Dial and Cody's life. So it's just, it's something to definitely, I think, look into reading if you are seeking to try and get outdoors, especially in March when it's still pretty cold here in Rochester. Um, and you're trying to step away a little bit and he definitely puts the perspective of you're with him on this journey and you get to really peek into his life and his son's life. So and anyway, um, and I'd also recommend listening to his interview with Dave Davies on Fresh Air. It's quite, it's quite good. Um, it's good to hear actually from the author and his own experience, you know, his words after reading his book. So anyway, I hope you pick up The Adventure of Sun by Roman Dial. Thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Carly Dennis. I'm the Teen Services Librarian. Today I'm going to be reviewing Thurgood Marshall by Terry Canefield. This book is part of the Making of America series. Other books um, in the series cover Alexander Hamilton, Andrew Jackson, Abraham Lincoln, Susan B. Anthony, Franklin D. Roosevelt. It's a series that's aimed at younger tweens, teens, kind of ages 10 to 14. Um, I think they're wonderful books for all ages. Um, this series is, all, all six books are available in the library um, as physical copies. They're also available on, on Hoopla um, on, in audio, so you can listen to all of them. Um, I won't lie, I was initially just really attracted to the covers. I thought that they were just really cool looking covers. And the concept, they're just these really short bag fees. That's like what the book itself looks like. Um, so I realized the person that I didn't know that much about was Thurgood Marshall. So I knew he was the first African-American Supreme Court Justice and that he was involved with Brown versus Board of Education, but that's about it. I didn't know any really details um, about his life. So this, um, this book tells his story in very short chapters. We learn about things that shaped him, including his politically active family, the neighborhood that he grew up in in Baltimore, Maryland in early 1900s. Um, we hear stories about individual family members, including an incredible story about his great-great-grandfather, which you need to read the book to learn more about that. Um, Thurgood Marshall was raised in a family that had very high expectations. His brother went on to become a doctor. Thurgood, of course, went on to become a lawyer. Um, and, but you also learn these little tidbits, like in his early college years, he wasn't a very serious student. He liked to socialize. He liked to attend parties. Um, but then he does start to get serious about school when he goes to Howard Law School. And it's at Howard Law School that he meets Charles Hamilton Houston. Um, who's the dean of the school. And a very 
important person in um, in Thurgood's life. He's uh, Houston is no joke. He's very serious. He expects his students to work really hard. Um, Marshall starts applying himself 100% to school. Meanwhile, you know, personally, he you know he marries Buster, his first wife. Um, and then he becomes a longtime civil rights lawyer for the NAACP. And it's when he's with the NAACP that he argues um, 32 cases before the Supreme Court. 29 of those cases he won. Um, these are all cases around civil rights. So he won 29 of the 32 cases that he argued before the Supreme Court. That's pretty impressive. So he's, his most well-known win, of course, is Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, which invalidated the concept of segregation in public schools. Um, this book does a really good job of showing context when they're telling Marshall's story. So you get like, um, you understand what life is like for black Americans during the Jim Crow era um, with um, the prominence of the KKK as well as lynchings. Um, and you also get like a, a, a shot into like a, a, a view of his personal life, like such as like the same year that he won Brown versus Board of Education, his first wife died of lung cancer, and that was very devastating to him. And um, so then skipping ahead, um, Thurgood Marshall is confirmed to the Supreme Court in 1967, and we learn how this happens and how people responded to it, you know, both positive and negative. Um, so I. I gave some highlights to the content of this book, but check it out. The narrative is lively. It's very approachable. It's really easy to just um, to to read it. Um, it's a great. It tells it like it's a story. Um, we hear about the civil rights cases that Marshall argues, and it's just incredible. He just had. He was just a brilliant mind. Um, it also contains photos and helpful explanation boxes um, throughout the, the book. And if you want to, you can, like I mentioned earlier, you can check it out on audio. Um, it is available on Hoopla and as well as the other books in the Making of America series. And these books are really short um, to listen to on, on audio. They're only four hours long. So thank you so much for listening to my review, and thank you so much for attending this virtual brown bag book review. Next up, we're gonna go back into the children's room and hear from two of our children's room aides, Lee and Sarah. Just as a heads up, the volume in Lee's video sometimes goes up and down, but please turn up your volume because the book they're talking about is worth a listen. So here they are. Hi. My name is Lee Cooney and I'm one of the children's room aides at the Fairport Public Library. Today I'd like to share with you a book called I Wish You All the Best by Mason Deaver. It's teen realistic fiction and one of the best books I've read recently. The book is told from the perspective of Ben, a high school senior who comes out to their parents as non-binary, but they are immediately kicked out of their house and forced to live with their estranged sister and her husband. Due to the trauma of coming out to their parents, Ben decides to keep their identity a secret at their new school and suffers through constant misgendering by teachers and new friends alike. Still, they manage to find a new home with their sister and must decide whether their parents will ever be their family again. It's a beautiful story about chosen family, finding your true home, and learning to love yourself. Written by a non-binary author, I Wish You All the Best is a candid exploration of the challenges struggles, and successes of non-binary and other gender non-conforming people. It takes a long, hard look at the biases and prejudices faced by queer people, but also the heartwarming joy of finally figuring out where you belong. Hi there, I'm Sarah and I work here in the children's room at Fairport Library. I'm going to give you my review on a memoir by Christy Tate. It's called Group, How One Therapist and a Circle of Strangers Saved My Life. Quick tip! If you're pressed for time, I highly recommend listening to it. I love listening to audiobooks, and I listened to this one through the Libby app, L-I-B-B-Y. I highly suggest you give it a download. In this memoir, 
we first meet Christy when she's traveling through Chicago, where she studies law. She's just found out that she's ranked top in her class, and she's fantasizing about her death. Christy is struggling with feeling isolated and loneliness, and she believes that her death will bring an end to the pain that she's feeling. Eventually, Christy begins group therapy. We meet all the different people that she crosses paths with and how she evolves to develop different relationships, particularly romantic relationships. She learns about how she's affected by the relationship with her parents and her past, how she has evolved with her eating disorder and the different people that she meets along the way. This book comes with a lot of heavy stuff, but I highly recommend you give it a chance. I adored spending time with Christy. She's very honest, she is raw, and she is very relatable. Even if you're someone who doesn't have a lot of experience with mental health or going to therapy, I think that spending time with Christy will give you great perspective, and it's lovely to be with someone who is honest and direct about what they're feeling and the struggles they're going through. I highly recommend you give this book a chance. It took me outside of my comfort zone, and I'm so glad that I was able to spend some time with Christy. And hey, give the Libby app a go. Thanks. Thank you both. That was their first time ever doing a brown bag book review. Can you believe it? They were like professionals. So next up, we've got Carl, our director, and Lauren, our assistant director, and they're both going to talk about some very interesting books. Hi, I'm Carl, and I hope you're enjoying your lunch right now. Welcome to my review for the Brown Bag Book Group. My book recommendation today is for Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. I've got a bit of a conf confession. I did not actually read this book. I listened to it. I had a very excellent audio book that um, I borrowed from the library and thought this was a phenomenal listen i imagine it'll be a phenomenal read because there's such you know humor and pathos in this story um you really begin to see and understand why charles dickens is so well lo loved and um considered such an excellent author so this story opens up in a cemetery you see on the cover of this edition of the book. And in the cemetery, Pip is visiting his parents' grave. He lives with his sister, who is very mean, sees him as a burden, and uh, Joe Gardry, his brother-in-law. Very loving caregiver, simple, but, um, but kind, and uh, a blacksmith great character and there's a great relationship between joe and pip and you can see both joe and pip are i don't know if the word is uh the best word is um not treated very well by pip's uh sister so they live uh, blacksmith's life on blacksmith's wages. However, one day, Miss Havisham, who lives in the, the village, a very wealthy, eccentric, um, elderly lady who has never married and has a room decorated for a wedding that never occurred, is training her uh, ward, Stella. And Pip, is brought in to play with Stella and meet with Stella, and he falls in love with her. Eventually, Miss Havisham pays for Pip's apprenticeship with Joe, and he stops visiting Stella. About four years later, Pip is visited by a lawyer, and he's coming to a great fortune. There's uh, money that is set aside for him, and to receive an education uh, as a gentleman and would one day be his as well so there was a huge mystery where did this 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 money come from who is giving it to him it's part of what also is very compelling in the story there's 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 a lot of twists there's a lot of turns plot twists and um there's so many different characters from rival escaped convicts 
con artists, the lawyer, the lawyer's paralegal, um, and, and so many great humorous characters. And, um, you know, ultimately, who is his benefactor? Who's this mysterious benefactor who wished to remain nameless? Um, it's, it's, it's an excellent story. You know, uh, a story that you, you may not have read in high school, you may not have read in college. And if it was something that you thought, you know, you wanted to read something that was a classic, uh, something that, you know, you may have missed out on. I, this is this is a fantastic book to do that. It's a great book uh, to be your starting base on, you know, reading something of uh, classic, uh, such classical weight as Charles Dickens, because it's, it is light. Um, um, and it was definitely a quick listen. I, I did not want to stop listening to it. You know, I would drive home. This is when I was uh, in college, driving back and forth between uh, the Rochester area and Buffalo. And when, when I arrived home, I would sit in the car just listening to this, this story. So uh, I always come back to it um, and have really, truly, truly enjoyed the, uh, the tale that's told here. Recommend it. And I'd like to know if, if, you, if, if, you've, if you've read it, how, how did you feel about it? And um, if you do read it, and you see me in the library, let me know if you liked it, if you thought it was enjoyable, or if this was a bad pick. Thank you, and uh, have a great day. Talk to you later. Hi, I am Lauren Hynette. I am one of the assistant directors here at the Fairport Public Library, and today I will be reviewing Nine Perfect Strangers by Wayne Moriarty. This was a great book. I loved it. It was such a great escape read. Um, and it opens with our main character who is Frances Welty. She is a romance author who is kind of coming to the end of her career, she sort of thinks. She, her career has seen a lot of highs and lows and she's certainly in a low right now. She's just received a particularly bad review um, and is kind of still still reeling from it. Um, so she decides in order to make herself feel better and maybe, um, you, you know, achieve some wellness, she checks herself into Tranquillum House, which is sort of like a Gwyneth paltrow -y, very goopy <laughs> um, wellness center in Australia. She is Australian. All of these characters are Australian. Um, and she checks herself in, it's for 10 days, and she is hoping to uh, make herself feel better from this review. She also has a particularly bad cough. She's hoping to achieve some wellness and, and also to heal from a particularly painful paper cut. <laughs> um, so that kind of gives you an idea, and she goes on about a paper cut for a little bit, so uh, that kind of gives you an idea of what kind of character she is. Um, but she's great, I loved, loved reading this through her voice. Um, and the really interesting thing is there are n nine guests in total who come to this house and um, the chapters do flip perspectives between all of them, um, which I, I really enjoyed. And, um, but we do start with Frances and you know, the longer she's there, she becomes more and more intrigued with the other guests. Some are there for wellness, some are there to lose weight, some are there to maybe repair their marriage. And then, you know, there's also a family there that's looking to strengthen their bond a little bit. Um, and all guests are there for 10 days, like I said. Um, and, you know, it's, it's the usual things of, it starts out with the usual things, like there's smoothies and yoga and midnight meditation. Um, and then Francis starts to notice some things are a little weird. Like there are cameras in every room, even though they are told that there's no screen time, they can't have cell phones, nothing like that. All of that's taken away from them. Um, and then, you know, when, even though she signed up on the website and read the fine print, there was nothing about how the first four days they have to be totally silent. They can't talk to each other. They're not allowed to look at each other. Even if they came with a spouse, you're not supposed to talk to your spouse at all, even in the privacy of your own room privacy. <laughs> Remember the cameras. So, um, it, and, and she starts, to, Francis starts to realize things are a little off about Tranquillum House. And, um, she's especially interested in the, uh, strange and ch but charismatic director, um, 
and who who does a lot of the midnight meditations with them and she's also really interested in in some of the other staff who um seem very gung-ho about about this wellness retreat and 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 really giving them all to the to the silent meditation um and you know on on one of on francis's first day she gets a massage from the massage therapist and uh it's it's right before the silence is about to begin and right before the last gong tolls she the masseuse leans into francis's ear and says don't let them make you do anything you don't want to do and so that kind of sets the tone things something is very off about this place um and i don't want to give too much away it's 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 a really great book um and the more you learn about the different characters the the, the better it gets so it does start off as a little bit of a slow burn but i would say by definitely halfway through the book i had to find out what happens and and it, it's a pretty wild ride i loved it it was really great um if you like other books by leanne moriarty moriarty for example her probably her biggest one to date is Big Little Lies. If you liked that, you will like this. It's it's pretty much in the same vein. Um, and I would I also wanted to mention that this has already, of course, been picked up by, I think, Hulu, and it will be a mini series with Nicole Kidman. So uh, I'm definitely looking forward to that. So I hope you read it and I hope you enjoy. Um, and I would love to talk to you about it if you come visit us at the Fairport Public Library. Last but not least, we have a favorite of Brown Bag, Hema, our retired librarian, who is sending hers in all the way from North Carolina. We're so glad you're with us, Hema. So here's two books that she recommends. Hi, I am Hema Paisatarzi, a retired librarian from Fairport. I have two books for you today. Uh, the first one is called Memorial Drive by Natasha Tresaway. This was published uh, last summer, summer of 2020. Uh, this is not only beautifully written and heartfelt, but it's also a story that needs to be told. Uh, Natasha recalls her mother, Gwendolyn, Gwendolyn's life and death, and it is both a fascinating and a tragic story. Natasha's parents, Rick and Gwendolyn, met in college and fell in love. Since they lived in the South, and this was in 1966, they were unable to marry in, the, in their home state. So they had to drive to Ohio to get married. Her father always told her that she needed to become a writer because her biracial upbringing was a story that should be told as it was quite unusual for that time and place. Unfortunately, her parents grew apart her father goes to uh, New Orleans to earn a master's degree, and after the divorce, uh, Natasha and her mother move to Atlanta so she can pursue higher, higher studies. Atlanta starts off as a, as a great place, and uh, her mother finds a part-time job so that she could uh, work on her degree during the day. But then her mother, Gwen, meets Big Joel, and she marries him and Natasha has a baby brother. Turns out Big Joe was a big mistake. Um, he was a vet, veteran, um, I forget which war. Um, and he is, uh, their life is very unpleasant. He uh, abuses her physically, emotionally, and threatens her. And this eventually ends up in Joe's murdering uh, Gwen. Uh, and the book follows Natasha as she comes to terms with this reality. Uh, Natasha Trethway is a truly gifted writer. I googled her right after finishing the book and found out that she has won an insane number of uh, writing awards, including a Pulitzer Prize, uh, twice named the U.S. Laurel, uh, Port Laureate, Laureate um, and that explains why the writing is so perfect. And she paints a beautiful picture with words. Uh, I will not kid you that the subject matter is tough, but it is the story is so relevant right now because it deals with some of our biggest issues today. Um, I forgot to mention that Eric was a white man, 
uh, Natasha's mother was a black woman. Um, racial in inequality is the major theme, and she um, she gets an inside view of how they are, how she is treated uh, because of their um, biracial uh, because of her biracial parents. Uh, how she's treated differently when she's with her father, she's she's uh, treated with respect, and uh, but when she's with her mother, she is dismissed or even treated rudely. And at the, at times, uh, the family was also threatened. Uh, so domestic violence is a big part of this story. And while the subject matter made it a tough read, I would still suggest it for the beautiful prose. In fact. I read it back to back uh, twice because it, the prose was so beautiful. My second book is a much different one in a much lighter vein. Um, it's called The Wife Upstairs by Rachel Hawkins. This book came out just two months ago. This is a quick read. It is a thriller and I, as I said, with a provocative title called The Wife Upstairs. And since it's a thriller, I won't give too much away. Um, it is about Jane, who is dirt poor. She grows up in foster homes. Um, she is running away from the past. She arrives in Birmingham, Alabama. And she is a broke dog walk walker in Thornfield Estates. This is a gated community full of huge mansions, shiny SUVs, and old housewives. It's the kind of place where no one will notice if Jane lifts some jewelry from their homes, from their side tables, etc. Um, each of their jackets hanging in the coat closet is worth more than Jane can earn all year long. But her luck changes, and she, she's busy dog walking for a few months, but her luck changes when she meets Eddie Rochester, who lives in one of those mansions. She finds out that he's recently widowed, and he is attracted to her, and he actually gets a puppy just so she can dog walk him. He is rich, brooding, handsome, and he offers her the kind of protection she's always wanted. And she, she longs to make a connection with him. And from the other housewives whom she works for, uh, she finds out that Eddie has, um, Eddie's wife died in some, under some mysterious circumstances. And basically, uh, she hasn't been found, but she's declared dead and she's vanished. Jane herself has a very mysterious past. And she's followed by blackmailers, phone calls, threats, threats, etc. Uh, the two start dating, and uh, Jane slowly uncovers Eddie's past, and Eddie uncovers Jane's past. So, um, read this book. It's a quick read, and find out who's hiding what, and really, what is the title all about? The wife upstairs by Rachel Hawkins. Thank you. That is everything. Now listen, I have a display for this in the library, so come on in. You can check out all the books you've heard about today, or you can pick up the list that tells you about all of the books, where you can find them, and how you can check them out from the library. Thank you so much to all of my book reviewers today. Thank you, the viewers. I couldn't do this without you, and we can't wait to see you back in the library.